Lord, I thank you for Steve. I thank you for his faith in you. Lord, uh, and we thank you for the hope that we have for an eternity in heaven with you. We thank you for Jesus Christ, for his perfect sacrifice to open the door for sinners like us to be with you. And now, Lord, we pray for the fathers in this room. We pray that you would be with us. Help us, Lord, to be intentional as we father the next generation, as we parent, as we serve as daddy and all the roles that we as fathers have to fill. We pray that you would empower us by your Holy Spirit to fill those roles, Lord. Thank you for each person who's here, and we thank you for your word. We pray that you would bless this time together this morning. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Unfortunately, our culture over the last number of decades has decided to mock fathers, to say that they're really optional, really not necessary, and yet every study I have ever seen about the importance of fathers proves time and time and time again endlessly how important fathers are in the lives of children. I, I saw one, or I heard this week of one interesting stat. They said that uh, mothers tend to do more of the work raising kids, which is not too surprising, but they said single mothers spend less time on average ra raising the next generation because they're so busy trying to provide and mother at the same time. And that's not at all in any way to be a discouragement against them. It's to show just how important fathers really are in the lives of the next generation. You know, having a dad in the home lessens the likelihood by a vast amount that a child will end up in uh, prison, that uh, teenage girls get pregnant less often when they have a father in the home. Uh, there are so many statistics on how much better it is for the next generation to have dad in the home, to have a loving father there for them, makes a world of difference to the next generation. And so we want to encourage the fathers in this room this morning. You know, parenthood, it's God's design in the first place. You know, I, I, I didn't think of it until right now, so I didn't have a chance to go back and double check, but I'm pretty sure the, the second command of Scripture, of course, we all know the first command, right? Don't eat the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. But I'm pretty sure the second command is be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. And, and within that second command is an order for us to become fathers. Now, I know that that isn't the plan for each and every man, but overall, that is God's plan for most men to become fathers, for most women to become mothers. And that is a, a good thing, an honorable thing, a, a thing that should be celebrated. And so we do want to celebrate you dads in the room today and to encourage you future dads in the room today to be good fathers and to understand how important your role is. We, we uh, have a streaming service in our house, and a new movie was released yesterday, and so uh, I got up, and first thing in the morning, kids are out watching this new movie, and it struck me another portrayal as a father who is a bumbling idiot. Only mom can fix it. Only mom has ideas to help. And, and you start to see how, you know, that in, in many ways is so disheartening to fathers. Our culture doesn't value fathers, even though every statistic says we should. <laughs> every study that our culture has done, every study around the world that I have ever seen says how important you are as a father in your home. But in our wisdom, our cultural elites want to mock your importance and denigrate your abilities, and they're dead wrong. And so we want to talk today about the roles of father, just some of the broad categories. And I know we could spend a whole lot more time. There's, uh, we could break this down a lot more, and there's probably a few categories that I've missed here. But some of the, some of the things that fathers are and husbands are to do, 
Number one is to protect. Protect your wife and your kids. I remember when we moved to Tucson, my wife and I didn't have any kids yet, but um, we bought a new house, as you often do when you move. It's kind of hard to take the old one with you. So we got a new house, and I remember there was a discussion about which side of the bed we got. Uh, because I tend to be hot at night and she does not. And so I wanted to be close to the wall where the air vent was. I'm like, well, this is perfectly sensible. <laughs> I quickly found out she didn't like this idea because she said, I want you closest to the door. So if anybody comes in, you're the first one that they get. <laughs> she wanted to be protected and I hadn't even thought about it in those terms, but she did because I think if we're really honest, deep in the heart of each woman, there's a desire for the protection that uh, a man, a husband can and should give. And so dads, I want to encourage you to intentionally protect your family, protect your wife and your kids. The next role is to provide, and this is one that most of us men understand. In fact, I'm not aware of a single man in our church who is not providing for his family, who, who is not working a job every day to provide for his family. And this is a good thing. And I want to congratulate you guys for how well you guys in this church are doing at working hard to provide for your family. You are worthy of praise and honor for that. Because you know, Scripture actually says, a man who professes faith in God and yet doesn't provide for his own family is worse than an unbeliever. Because you know better. And so, you got to understand that even though our society devalues Father and mocks men, God sees you working hard <laughs> You're taking an oxygen lance to open a steel ladle at your job. This <laughs> is one of the guys we were talking about. Uh, work week. It's awesome. That is a good thing. Whatever you are doing, whatever God has given you to do to provide for your family, you need to hear. Scripture has a great deal of praise for you and a great deal of condemnation if you're not. But there's not a single man in our church who is not actively engaged in providing for his family. And so I want to applaud you for that, especially because then I don't have to have an awkward conversation about, okay, <laughs> uh, it's time for you to make some changes. It's time for you to contribute to society. It's time for you to provide for your wife and your kids. That's a good thing. And that's a God-designed thing. You need to see that. And you need to understand that Monday morning, tomorrow, when the alarm clock goes off and you have to get out of bed and go to work, you are honoring God. You are, in that element, in that area of your life, you are being a godly man by providing for your family. So thank you for that. You are worthy of great honor for that when you protect, when you provide. The next one is God calls us as men to be leaders, leaders in the home, spiritual leaders, and not to lead like the, the, you know, like the SS, like the Gestapo, to lovingly lead as, as partners together, but nonetheless to lead, to lead spiritually, to lead in all areas of the family. One of the areas that, I, as you guys know, we homeschool our kids, and one of the areas that I lead in is I serve as principal. I am at work when class is happening, so I'm, I get a... <laughs> I get a call on my phone. Can you talk to, <laughs> insert child name. Somebody is unmotivated today. Somebody is having a bad attitude today. Somebody is, insert issue. And so I fill that role of leader. I fill that role as homeschool principal because it's important, because also God has put in the hearts of most every child I've ever met an understanding <laughs> that you don't mess with dad, <laughs> that <laughs> the rubber is about to meet the road or your rear end um, because <laughs> dad won't put up with. And that's part of our role, folks. That's part of our role, men. She, she needs, your wife needs your support, needs you to back her up in raising these kids. 
And lastly, for the list this morning, like I said, it could go on and on, but they need us to affirm them. They need us to encourage them. Our wives and our children need us to speak into their lives good things to observe. Because see, leading, and, in, and especially leading in discipline, we highlight the bad. I need you to quit screwing around and do your school. I need you to not ever do that again. <laughs> I need you to stop slamming the door. I need you to, you know, insert problem here. But in affirming, we observe not the bad, but we observe the good about them. You're made in God's image. God's blessed you with these talents and these abilities. Even apart from any talent or ability, you are made in the image of God, and I see value in you because of that. And that's why every human being is valuable. Because we are all made in the image of God as Christians. We should never demean the value of any human being because we're all made in God's image. And so we're going to focus today on our role of fathers as affirming the good we see in our wives and in our children. Now I want to start with a dad fail. We've all, we've all probably seen those videos of dad fails and on, on YouTube and different places. Well, Scripture is really, the Bible is an amazing book. Because like, unlike any other book from ancient history, the Bible actually includes the failures of the people in it. Because in ancient history, if you want to find out the failures in Rome, you almost always have to go to another empire that defeated them to find out the truth. In fact, we actually, you know how the news media today tends to spin things, only tell half the story to try to advance their political agenda? most of them, unfortunately. Well, that's not a new thing. I was watching a, 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 a show on history, and they were talking about this, as I recall, it was a, a Roman general who went out to war, and he comes back, and there's, <laughs> there's actually a, a thing carved in stone honoring his victory. But when you go to the other side, and historians believe the other side is a little bit more honest, they actually won. It was, in essence, it was a close battle, but it was a Roman defeat, and yet this Roman general comes back and says, oh, look at me, look what I did. He, so, spin on the nightly news is nothing new. It's just that they used to carve it into marble. Today, they put it on the airwaves. The Bible is so completely different than any other book in ancient history because it includes the faults and failures and foibles of its heroes and heroines. And that's one of, the, one of the things that differentiates history from spin. That tells you this source is more trustworthy than other sources. Because it doesn't just tell us, oh, Jacob, or also known as Israel, was the greatest dad ever. Like some spin on the news media, on the nightly news, would tend to portray people they agree with. So, now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generation, generations of Jacob. Joseph, when he was 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now, a couple of observations real quick. Polygamy is a bad idea. Now, it's something that God allowed in the Old Testament. Uh, as I understand it, one of the reasons is mainly because, well, a, as we find out in the, um, later on, when it's springtime, the kings and their men, their troops, all went out to war. So there were not enough men to provide husbands for each woman. So this was God's way of providing husbands and continuing the process of filling the earth, you know, being fruitful, multiply, filling the earth, and, and uh, uh, gaining r rulership over the earth, dominion over the earth. And yet, we see here how it can be such a great struggle. You have this intra-family conflict set up instantly when you have multiple wives because, well, I'm a, 
I'm a half-brother at this point for you. But again, I'm not condemning Israel for that. This was practice of his day. And yet, we know that God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Eve and Mary and Jane and Sue. Adam and Eve, one man, one woman. We know that Jesus said, you know, in the, from the beginning, God created the male and female for each other. One man, one woman. That's the picture at the start and the, and the picture again in the New Testament. And that's why we as a church today hold that Polygamy is not a good idea because there are great struggles that come along with it. So it's something that's allowed in Scripture in the Old Testament, but it's not God's ideal. So anyhow, you have this intra-family conflict there. We're going to see that kind of erupt here in the next couple of verses. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored tunic. Joseph comes along when... Jacob here is an old man. Now, the other thing that we know from the rest of the story of Genesis is not only was Joseph beloved because he was a son of Jacob's old age or Israel's old age, but also he's the son of his favorite wife. Yes, there was a pecking order in the wives too, and she is the one who he mourned for more than any of his other wives. She is the one, uh, Joseph's mother, was near and dear to the heart of Isaac, more so than his other wives. And again, we see why polygamy is not a good idea. And so the issue comes when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Sibling rivalry. It's bad enough when you only have two parents, a mom and a dad, (laughs) and it just gets even worse when you have multiple moms with one dad, it's bad enough when you have, oh, say, just two kids that want to fight with each other all the time. You know, the oldest one is there and the younger one comes along and dethrones them. <laughs> oh, there's some real struggles. Those first couple months can be real challenging. <laughs> but it's not just the first couple months, the teenage years and elementary school years and basically most of life until they become adults. Hopefully, they've grown up enough by then to get along and play nice. Or they're still working on it. Um, So, (laughs) but his brothers couldn't even say a kind word to Joseph. How sad is that? But I want us to notice that part of it is a pretty big dad fail. Part of it is Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. And that's a reminder that we as dads really need to treat our kids equally. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to do everything the same with all your kids. Like uh, Luke and I are talking about going, doing go-karting. That doesn't mean that I have to take Faith go-karting. She may not feel loved that way. A tea party with her might be more fitting. Or something different with grace. You know, each child needs love, but they may take love in different ways. So that doesn't mean I have to take all four of them go-karting and then all four of them to a tea party and all, you know, but, but we all need to express love to our children. We all need to love them equally. And this can be tough as fallen human beings because sometimes we have one, <clears throat> one or two that are like our personality and we tend to gravitate towards them. Or maybe they're opposite than us, and (laughs) our own personality really bothers us sometimes, Uh, you know, especially without all the rough edges sanded off. So we gravitate towards the other one who's not like us personality-wise. We've got to fight against that so that we love all of our children equally, even though that expression of love may be different for each individual. Because we want to learn from the dad fail here of Jacob. And I was, as I always do, you know, those, those people that make the joke, so, so you're a pastor. <laughs> so what do you do for work the other five days of the week, or six days of the week, you know? <laughs> like, well, the message doesn't just make itself. I do research every week, I promise. So I was doing research this week, and look at, who's laughing? That's not, 
I really do, I promise. Um, I was watching videos on dads and the importance of dads and doing research, finding, digging through studies and all this stuff online. And, and one that stuck out to me this week about the importance of dads came from a Dr. Meg Meeker. And she had a list of three questions that every kid looks to dad to get answered. She said, you know, moms can answer this. But it's really not settled in a child's heart until dad answers these three questions. Now, just a little history on her. She's a medical doctor. She's not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. But she is actually uniquely placed to observe family dynamics through her practice. Because one of the things that science has figured out is that as soon as somebody knows you're observing their behavior, they often will answer in different ways. They often will change their behavior because they know they're being observed. And anytime you've used Google Maps and it comes up with speed trap ahead, you know you're being observed, and so you hit the gas and do 90 miles an hour, right? No, you change your behavior to be in line with what they expect you to be doing, what the law demands you to be doing. And so even though she's a medical doctor, a pediatrician, she is actually very well placed to observe behavior without affecting it in the families that, whose children she cares for. And so she has some really interesting things to say. She, of the three questions, she says the first one is, Dad, what do you believe about me? Am I good? Am I smart? Am I capable? Am I dumb? Do you call me stupid? Do you, and you can fill in a long list, what do you believe about me? This is a question intrinsic in each child's heart. The second question she says is, Dad, how do you feel about me? Am I lovable? Am I, I good? Do you like me? Are you ashamed of me? Are you embarrassed by me? The third question that kids look to Dad to answer is, Dad, what are your hopes for me? Do, you, do I have a future? Do you have any hopes for me at all? Or, or do you just speak into my life that you think I'm going to be a failure? These are important questions that each child is looking to dad to answer. And deep in their heart of hearts, looking for dad to find meaning, hope, value, and purpose in my life as a child. And so, as fathers, our children need us to express love for them all and to love them all equally. That's the dad fail of Jacob's life. Not loving all of his sons equally. And so we as dads today want to avoid falling in those traps, falling into those pitfalls. And so we want to love all of our children equally. I've shared this story before, but it, it bears repeating. Uh, one of the church uh, members that I had ministered to and, and counseled with over the years shared how when her parents got divorced, her dad still lived in town and would come and pick up her brothers and take them go-karting and mini-golfing and batting cages and, and do fun things, take them camping. And he told his wife when she confronted him about it, he said, well... She's a girl, and I just don't know what to do with a girl, and that's just heartbreaking. And even though I don't know if he intentionally, he just kind of thought, well, mom can love the girls, and I'll love the boys, and everybody will be fine, I would bet, if you talk to him. That's what he would say, and yet there's a special need in a daughter's heart for dad to love her, and a special need in a son's heart for dad to love him, just like there's a special need in boys' and girls' hearts for mom to love them. And so we as parents can do real harm to our children if we don't love them both equally, love them all the same, even though the expressions are different. The ways that individuals feel loved are different. Some people really, really enjoy, really are blessed by a word of affirmation. Some people it's quality time, some people it's gifts, some people it's acts of service. And I forgot the fifth of the five love languages. And... and <laughs> Clearly, I should have written them down or made a slide. But despite my humanness and the frailty of my memory, um, we need to love our kids. And each of our kids is unique. And each of them is special. And the part of the reason, the, the, the core reason they are special is because all human beings are made in the image of God. 
And so male and female created he them in his image. And that's why women are every bit as valuable. Our daughters are every bit as valuable as our sons. Because we are all equally made in God's image. And so our kids need us to speak this into, our li- into their lives. And, you know, the reality of uh, the more broken the, uh, our society gets, the more we wander away from God's path, the more there is a need for grandfathers and even great-grandfathers to step in and serve as surrogate fathers sometimes, unfortunately. But that's life in a fallen and broken world, and so that's what we as men should be doing. And some, you know, maybe it's not your own kids, but maybe it's kids in your neighborhood that need a surrogate dad, an adopted dad, an adopted granddad, because we live in a society where so many dads are missing. And so as, as followers of Christ, we want to be a good neighbor to those around us who need a dad figure. Of course, it has to start at home. We need to focus on our own kids first, but also to be open to helping those single moms in our area and moms helping single dads in our area raise their kids appropriately. And so from the dad fail that Scripture records with Isaac or with uh, Jacob and uh, with uh, Joseph there and the other sons, we want to go to the perfect dad because, let's face it, he's the only one. Every father has failed. Every earthly father has made mistakes, has come up short, myself included. All the dads in the room said amen, right? Because we've all come short at some point in our lives. But aren't you grateful we have a perfect father? Somebody pointed out, you know, he spoke over his son. He affirmed his own son. Now, I was thinking about this. I don't believe this is actually just for Jesus. In fact, I don't think it's primarily for Jesus because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are so uniquely connected to each other that Jesus already knew the Father's opinion of him. This is more about the crowd that he's with, more about the people around him who don't yet know for sure that he's the Son of God. This happens at his baptism. Jesus comes up out of the water, and immediately a voice from heaven is heard saying, uh, well, picking up at verse 17, and behold, a voice out of the heavens said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Father spoke over his Son's life on the earth here, spoke affirmation over him. This is my beloved Son. In, In essence... I was thinking about it. I was like, in essence, God the Father answered all three of Dr. Meg Meeker's questions that she'd observed 2,000 years later that kids need Dad to answer in their hearts and their lives. God the Father had always done it. It's my beloved Son. I value Him. He is of worth to me, in whom I am well pleased. I see his character, I see his future, I see what he's done, what he's going to do. I see who I've made or who he is. <laughs> Be real careful. Uh, I see who he is. The father did not make the son. Uh, but you and I as dads, the reason I made that verbal faux pas there is you and I as dads see who God has made our children to be and see the value in them because of God's creation of them. But the father spoke words of affirmation over the son in a world that was rejecting him. Our kids need us as fathers to speak over them, to speak into their lives and their hearts because, well, let's face it, kids can be really cruel. To hear some of the kid things that kids at school say to one another is just really heartbreaking. To see the kids, the things that homeschool kids say to one another can be really heartbreaking. Lest you homeschoolers think you get away from this. Um, We live in a broken, fallen world that often wants to highlight the shortcomings and ignore the value and the abilities in the individuals that make up this world. 
But God the Father is the only perfect Father. And He's a great example to follow. Our wives and our kids need us to encourage them, need appropriate physical affection, need words of affirmation, need encouragement, need us as leaders, providers, protectors, and need us to affirm them. And so as fathers, our children need us to express love for all of them and to love them all equally. And because we live in a fallen and broken world, our kids have a continuing need for affirmation from their fathers. There's a lot of people around who will put them down. A lot of their peers, a lot of, sometimes even teachers will think, well, that kid has no future. They need a dad who sees that kid does have a future and a hope and has abilities and talents and is precious because they're made in the image of God. And that's part of why God has given us fathers. Now, in light of talking about a perfect father, we have to face the fact that all of us have fathers who were flawed. All of us have dads who come short. And for many in the room today, Mother's Day and Father's Day are especially tough days because you come to church and you hear us encouraging, you hear us talking about how important mothers and fathers are and how, uh, what a godly influence they can be, and yet in the back of your mind you know how many struggles and how much trauma and how, many, how deeply marked in your soul you are from the sins and shortcomings of your mothers and your fathers. And I want you to hear that we understand that as well today. That just about each of us in the room have been marked by the shortcoming of a mom or a dad. And we don't want to gloss over that. And we don't want to ignore that. We don't want to ignore your struggle and suffering because all of us have fallen parents. There's only one perfect parent ever, God the Father. And so, for those of you who have been through tough childhoods, for those of you who lost a parent, those of you whose parent abandoned them, those of you whose parents said things that still cut you to the bone today, I want you to hear, you have a perfect Father in God the Father. And He loves you, and He looks at your life, and He sees purpose, He sees a future, He sees a hope, He sees a person made in His image, He sees someone of value. Don't forget that. As you try to walk past and overcome the marks in your soul left by your parents' shortcomings, I want, you to I want to encourage you to remember also they didn't have a perfect earthly mom or dad either. And many times the marks they left on our souls come from the marks that were left on their souls. There's a generational sin tendency. But at the same time, we can rest in knowing that all of us have a perfect heavenly Father who looks at you and sees the potential that He's built into you, looks at you and sees the man or the woman He's made you to be, the man or the woman that if you're a teen or a child here today, that He is making you to be. And He loves you. Don't forget that. When you find those areas of wounds in your life that your own parents have left, that your earthly fathers have left, I want to encourage you to remember you have a perfect Father in heaven. And then it's not just a perfect Father in heaven, kind of a nebulous, He's out there and He loves children and God so loves the world, but God so loves you. Each and every one of us who have been adopted as His children, He loves you as an individual. You need to hear that. You know, I, I, 
I couldn't find the exact reference, but I know that Scripture says God has written your name on the palm of His hand. The Psalms talk about how God dances over His children. There's a great joy in His children. The the Scripture talks about how precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of His children because you will be with Him. You will be freed from sin. You'll be in His presence. And some of us in this room today need to hear that desperately, that God values you as a person. Now, unfortunately, (laughs) the Bible teaches that, and the modern church movement, many movements in the modern church have taken that and run with it too far to make us like more valuable than we are like that you know he didn't want heaven without you well that's not exactly what scripture says <laughs> he wanted you to be with him in heaven that's keeping the cart behind the horse keeping you and me as less important than god because we know he is more important than us and yet Because He's made us, He's stamped His image in our soul, we are of great value to Him. So we want to walk that fence of truth, that balance beam of truth between the modern church movement that wants to make us so important, and in so doing make God less important, and some of the older ways of looking at it that we're just scum and dirt and worms. No, we are valued by Him as individuals made in His image and His likeness. Don't ever forget that. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called the children of God. And such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know Him. All of us who have been saved, have been adopted by God and are, and are His children. And, and the verb here is in the present tense. We are now His children. Now, we also know that the Apostle Paul would write that we look forward to the day of our adoption. And so it is a, a legal process happening now. We have been adopted. And, and the start of adoption happens in, happens in eternity past when God chose a people for His name and His glory. And we continue the process of the adoption happening in life. We are now His children adopted. And someday we look forward to the day when all the paperwork is signed when we meet Jesus and the adoption is finalized. And of course, the verses after this is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture that says, we will be like Him, Jesus, for we shall see Him as He really is. The day we meet Christ face to face, we will be freed from our sin. And then we will finally be rightfully able to understand our value and yet still value God more than ourselves. Because, folks, you can look in the world around us and you can see some people that value themselves way too much, and that's a real problem. Arrogance and boastfulness and pride come when that happens. We also see many people who value themselves way too little think they're worms and scum and dirt. We all have to understand we are broken. So on a spiritual level, there is great sickness, great evil, death in us. And yet, even in the midst of that, each and every person is made in the image and likeness of God and is therefore of incalculable value. You need to know that deep in your soul. Because you have some people that tend to value themselves too much, and I'm a, I've got life all together. I'm such a great example. Look at me. And then we have some who struggle with devaluing themselves and not seeing you're made in the image and likeness of God. Just that imprint alone makes you of incredible value. Regardless of what you do, regardless of what you accomplish, Regardless of who others see you, you, each and every one of you is valued because God the Father made you. And as Christians, you are especially valued because He looked at you and said, I love this one. He chose you before the foundations of the world to be adopted. 
And so we are greatly valued. And yet, remaining humble at the same time, knowing that we're sinners. We need to know God the Father loves us. Each and every one of us who've been adopted, each and every one of us who's come to salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, knowing how through Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone, and yet each of us knowing true, saving, biblical faith is never alone. It changes how we live. If you and I could really grasp how much God loves us despite our flaws and our failures, it would completely revolutionize how we live in this world. Because so many things that we do, so many thought patterns that we have are learned behaviors that serve as a crutch to try to help us overcome some of the damage that's been done to us. Some of the words, some of the, the most evil things that I've heard of are the words that cut to a person's soul. That friends, co-workers, siblings speak, but most deeply hurt when spoken by parents, when spoken by fathers. So be careful, but also understand some of the reasons you have struggles in your life can be traced back to believing our earthly parents in their flawedness and the damage they've done to us and discounting what your heavenly Father says about you. That He looks at you and says I love you I chose you I have seen your struggles your hurts the damage you've gone through and you are still precious to me and I know there's some of you in the room this morning that need to hear that because it's been so lacking in your, from your earthly father. I understand that. But I want you to hear that from your heavenly father. He loves you with a perfect love. No matter what this world has said about you, no matter what this world has put you through, no matter the shortcomings of your earthly father, God the Father loves you. And so as fathers, our children need us to express love for them all and to love them all equally. And because we live in a fallen and broken world, our kids have a continuing need for affirmation from their fathers, for love from their fathers. And by faith alone, we are adopted into the family of the only perfect father ever. I want to close with a story from Dr. Meg Meeker of how important words of affirmation were to, in her life. She said, my dad was a, a pathologist, and she said he, he was dealing with body parts all the time. She's like, that's gross. I don't want to be a pathologist. But she said, I thought, but maybe I could be a doctor, a pediatrician to help little babies come into this world and, and help them grow up healthy. And, and so from the time she was 16 onward, she, it was all about medical school. I got to get good grades and get into med, med school. And so she said, at 21, I started to send out applications. You know, it's time. I'm through, almost done with undergrad, and you, you got to take your, uh, you know, your test to get in. And she said, I got what felt like an avalanche of rejection letters, just one after another after another. All these med schools I applied to did not want me, did not see the potential in me to become a doctor one day. And she said, one day in the midst of this time when I'm starting to think maybe I don't have what it takes to be a doctor, she said, one, and 
She said one day she was walking by her dad's study and she heard him on the phone back in the day when all phones still had corns on them, you know. <laughs> and she said, I heard him talking to this friend and he said, well, you know, my daughter Meg is going to be a doctor here in a few years. She said, in a time when I had just about lost hope that there would be a med school that would accept me, would see the potential in me to be a doctor someday, she said, I desperately needed that word of affirmation from my dad that it was a done deal. She's going to be a doctor someday. Her dad had faith in her. And she said, my dad was an introvert, very quiet, didn't speak much, but when he did speak, you knew that he meant it because words didn't just flow out of his mouth. She said, at that moment, I desperately needed that encouragement. And of course, she did become a doctor and has served as a doctor and has written, last time I heard, at least seven books based on her experience as a doctor to encourage families. She needed that affirmation. Guys, we need to understand how important our words can be don't fall off of one side and turn to flattery because you can control people by, oh, you're so great, and you can get them to do things they didn't, wouldn't normally do by flattery, and we, that's not what we're talking about here. But the other, so to fall off the other side of the balance beam of truth of how we should behave is to never encourage, to only highlight the failures and not encourage the good, the value, the purpose, and the future that God has for your wife and your children. And so I want to encourage you as dads and myself included to affirm, to express love, to encourage our children, all the while knowing we only have one perfect father, God the Father. And so in the ways that we come short, men, know that someday our children will have to learn to rely on Him, the perfect father, but we should do everything in our power to follow in his footsteps as fathers. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for each of the dads in this room. Uh, I know, thank you for their patience as we've gone a little long, but it's so vital when we have young kids that we hear this, that we take this to heart as men, and we value our role of affirming our children and our wives. Help us to do this. Help us learn how to get better at doing this. And God, help our families in the ways that we come short. Thank you that you have adopted us, chosen us by name, and loved us. Thank you so much for that, for demonstrating your love. Now, Lord, help us as fathers to demonstrate our love for our wives and our children. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.